The ESP is a unique block. I'm not talking about how useful or popular it is, although it's both of these things, but rather the fact that amongst all the blocks that I can remember, it's uniquely controversial. Today, we're having another debate around the ESP block, specifically though, around the statement that the ESP block should be a plan A block for analgesia. It's critical that we understand what a plan A block is. So plan A blocks were a concept first described by Turbot and colleagues in 2020, subsequently endorsed by the RA UK Society, who proposed seven core regional anesthesia techniques, of which the ESP was one. The basis for planning blocks is to identify a small number of core regional anesthesia techniques that the majority of anesthesiologists can learn to perform, with the ultimate aim of extending the use of regional anesthesia to as many patients as possible. The ESP was chosen as a plan A block for the thorax because of its relative simplicity and safety and the existing evidence for efficacy. It's like a Swiss knife. It may not work as well as a specialized tool, but it'll generally get the job done if it's all you have. Now, we're not debating whether the ESP is the best block for thoracic or abdominal analgesia in terms of efficacy, nor are we debating this from the point of view of a regional anesthesia subspecialty enthusiast and practitioner. The thesis for this debate is, if you could only choose one block to teach a trainee, or if a non-regional anesthesia specialist anesthesiologist was going to invest into learning just one block for torso analgesia, what would you choose? And here the criteria are a little bit more broad. It's like as if you're shopping for a car. You'll naturally ask, what's the best car out there that I could buy? But hold on. Remember that this may not be for you nor is it necessary for somebody like Max Verstappen is one of his off-track cars. Instead, as a plan A, you're choosing a car for the 18-year-old who got their license two weeks ago. And I'm going to say that you would choose an ESP block as plan A for the same reason that you might choose one of these cars. And I'll quickly review each of these reasons in turn. Let's start with accessibility and simplicity of performance. It's definitely easier than a thoracic paravertebral block, as this learning curve study of inexperienced trainees show. Now, if we compare it to other thoracic fascial plane blocks, then the ESP block isn't necessarily easier because those are also simple blocks to perform. And in fact, one limitation of the ESP block is that you have to turn the patient prone or at least lateral to perform it. You can't do it in the supine position. However, the ESP block is also a very useful learning tool for the motivated practitioner because the imaging and needle approach is so similar for ESP and the parasagittal in-plane approach to paravertebral blocks, the motivated practitioner can graduate themselves from doing ESPs to paravertebral blocks. And while this is happening, more patients can benefit from regional anesthesia as a result. However, just because a block is easy, that isn't enough of a reason to do it. It has to work as well, which brings us to the efficacy of the ESP. There have been some negative studies for efficacy published recently, including this one in cardiac surgery. And certainly in this context, I won't deny that there may be better techniques to use here. However, as Power et al. point out in their excellent article, which I recommend is a very well-balanced and informative resource, the evidence base is still supportive of efficacy for thoracoabdominal surgery. However, with the caution that the size of the clinical effect can be unpredictable. I believe that one reason for this is that the originally described technique may not be optimal for achieving blockade of the anterolateral torso. Our understanding of the anatomy and how the ESP block works and thus how to optimally perform it has evolved significantly since we first described it in 2016. I've described this in more detail online, but briefly, if we're interested in just covering the posterior torso, then the original technique of targeting the bony transverse process and looking for linear spread under the erector spinae muscle holds true. If, however, we want coverage of the anterolateral torso, we need a local anesthetic to penetrate into the region of the paravertebral space and intervertebral foramina. And this penetration is maximized by depositing the local under the deep fascia of erector spinae muscle so that we minimize the distance and the barriers to spread. I therefore recommend that you should not aim to land on the transverse process itself, but to target the edge of the transverse process and to slide a little deeper off it 
so that injection is clearly occurring under the erector spinae muscle rather than within it. We do not want to see intramuscular spread or expansion. The safety profile of the ESP block remains the biggest attraction for most practitioners. With good reason, because ultimately we all believe in the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. And I've updated that to my personal motto for regional anesthesia, which I tell all of my trainees. Safety before efficacy before efficiency. I'm less worried about a block that doesn't provide perfect analgesia, and I'm more worried about causing injury. The site of injection and needle placement is distant from major blood vessels, nerves, or important internal organs. Neural injury has never been described with an ESP block, and there's no reason to believe that this should ever occur. You can in good faith describe the ESP block as an injection into the muscles of the back rather than into the spine, and I find that patients are tremendously reassured when I tell them that we are, in fact, nowhere near their spinal cord. Surgeons are also less likely to object, at least on the grounds of patient safety. As a result, I think it's quite clear that this is a pretty safe block in patients who have coagulation abnormalities, as bleeding complications are very rare. The risk of a pneumothorax should also theoretically be zero, even if your needle tip localization is suboptimal, as the margin for error is so large. Hypotension has been reported in the literature, but this is comparatively rare and is really a function of how close you're depositing local anesthetic to the spinal nerve roots in the paravertebral space and epidural space, and thus how much of a sympathetic block you get. Which in turn is the trade-off for a block that works really well, and a block that's in effect a true paravertebral, even an epidural. The most likely adverse effect is a local anesthetic systemic toxicity or last event, but this is still rare, and the severity of these events is usually minor. We now have recent studies that support the risk of plasma concentrations in the toxic range being minimal. In fact, the venous concentrations measured after a 2 mg per kilo dose of bupivacaine are several orders of magnitude below the toxic thresholds. Note that this was using a 1 in 200,000 or 5 mics per mil epinephrine-containing solution of bupivacaine. I would always encourage the use of epinephrine-containing local anesthetic solutions because, as you see from this comparative study of plain and epinephrine-containing levobupivacaine, the epinephrine significantly reduced maximum concentrations and plasma concentrations at all measured time points, and thus the risk of last as well. It does not seem to change the duration of analgesia, however. One note of caution, I have noticed in some patients that the epinephrine itself can sometimes cause tachycardia, tremors, or feelings of anxiety or being mildly unwell within the first 10 or 15 minutes after the block. This is somewhat similar to the flight or fight response that one feels after an abrupt shock with a physiological catecholamine surge. The last reason I'll leave you with for ESP as a plan A block is that it is one of the most versatile blocks of the torso. You can perform it at different thoracic vertebral levels and so target specific thoracic and thoracoabdominal nerves of interest. There isn't just one or two specific applications and the basic technique is the same no matter what level you're targeting. I want to close by returning to Amit Pawa's article. If you just read the title or the conclusion, you might be misled. The authors emphasize all the points in favor of the ESP that we've just discussed. Note too that the authors are all actual clinicians and not armchair academics. They're also not flag-waving ESP enthusiasts either. Indeed, Ahmad Pawa's declared favorite block is the paravertebral block. They clearly state that inclusion of ESP as a plan A block for thoracoabdominal analgesia is not disputed. What is disputed, hence the question mark in their title, is that it is the one and only or ultimate plan A block i.e. that it can be used as a plan A block for upper and lower limbs. And this I agree with completely. The ESP block should not be the first line technique in this context. That's not to say that it doesn't have its users, which we've described elsewhere, but it's very much a special tool for certain situations where the conventional first line techniques of brachial plexus blockade or lower limb nerve blockade are not feasible or desirable.